You having a laugh? Me? You? Me? Yeah, I'm having yeah, a you, laugh. You having a laugh? I'm, I'm, I'm not having a laugh. Oh, do you want to? Oh, I thought you'd been a bit aggressive there. Um, yes. Queer Pleasant Strangers, excellent podcast. Two queer trans ladies talk about oh. things they've played, watched, and listened to. What? What? Wonderful recommendation. No I'm problem. Glad that is not a secret you being Aggie thing. No, mate. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. Oh, you, you, you have it off. Greetings, strangers, queer and pleasant. I'm not Laura Kate Magnet Dale. And I'm not Jane Harris Magnet Dale. Uh, and welcome to another episode of Queer and Pleasant Strangers, a podcast where two queer trans ladies who are married talk about stuff we've played and watched and listened to and stuff. You threw me. I, this is the first week we put the, the Magnet Dales at the end, and I was suddenly like, oh no, the routine. I have <laughs> mouthfeel. I do this stuff on autopilot. You can't make me change the words without warning. They're good words, though. We did talk about it previously. We did, but also, it, it's like changing the whole, uh, oh, you can find me on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Patreon, like that thing at the end. If, if, I, if I get stumbled up on it, I'm like, oh no, how do I words? How do you words? I, I mean, words, words are difficult. Words I don't, are very difficult. I don't think about most of the ones I do. They just sort of happen. That's fair. We've got a podcast to do. What are you playing this week? Oh, which, which, two weeks. Two weeks, yes. Two weeks. Yeah, we didn't record last week because we had a... Birthdays. We had we had we, birthdays and we had a visit from the lovely James Stephanie Sterling and Phoenix Toothill came to visit. And we didn't really want to try and get a recording in and then also have guests arriving at the same time. It was going to be a lot. It was going to be a, an awful Yeah. Lot. Well, what have we played the last... Two weeks. Um, I played some uh, off-world trading company. Ooh, tell me about that. Uh, so basically, you are trying to set up companies on Mars uh, that will produce things like food and oxygen and fuel and heat uh, in order to uh, help people who are surviving there. And Ooh. you have various different factions. So you have the scientists who are very, very pure science-driven and they're all about wanting to uh, get... Uh, like more technology built and more uh, more chemistry, more sort of other sciencey stuff. Then you've got like sort of an underclass. They were sort of like they were um, very much uh, on the back foot back on Earth. Yeah. And they're like, you know, we're gonna we're, we're bodging some stuff. Our, all our equipment might not be as safe as everyone else's, but fuck it, we're out here, we're yeah. going to be intrepid, we're going to do the thing. We, we might get some stuff done that you can't because we're willing to do the stuff that... Yeah, it's not perfect, but we'll do it anyway. We're much more willing to work with the pirates and the hackers yeah. and, and those sorts of groups. Um, and then you've got like the ultra-capitalists who are all about the marketing and all about selling things and... Hey, we've got to turn a profit on this oxygen. Oh, no. Yeah. Not them. Yeah. No. Yep. Um, overall, uh, I, I liked the tutorial. I liked the concept. But I uh, was, um, wasn't was super happy with the rest of the game. Yeah. Much. Um, yeah, there are... Like, once you actually get into the game itself, it becomes like this super fast, super aggressive... Um, like, uh, like, although the capitalists aren't the only group, it feels like that that is still the way you have to play very much. Hmm. Like, you can lose simply by having your company bought out from under you if you're not quick enough. Yeah. Uh, you can lose, yeah, like the, the other, the, I think the first full game I played through on Skirmish was just, uh, I played against like five other factions just to really get a feel for it. Um, and, like, before I knew it, like, it was just a race to the finish of everyone else has been bought out or, yeah. or gone bankrupt. And it was just me and one other person, and it was a case of how much can I sell off as quickly as possible Yes, in order to get enough money to buy them out before they buy me out. Uh-huh. I was like, I, this is not my playstyle. <laughs> no. It's a shame, but um, I think it was another one of those ones I got from the Epic Store as they're like their free yeah, game yeah. of the week, probably some time ago. And I went through mm -hmm. the list. I was like, "Oh, that looks. I'll give that a That's look." I've been enjoying 
some some Mars based terraformy goodness recently. Yeah. I'll give that. Oh no. Oh no. It's a shame because I th- I think it's got some really great ideas there. It just bits about it aren't really working for me. But you know, doesn't yeah. have to be for me. Doesn't have you. to be for you. Um, before I get on to what I've played, I want to mention a games related thing I'm just very excited and proud about. Uh, anyone who has an Android phone, I believe anywhere in the world, there's a couple of countries that are outliers, like uh, South Korea is an outlier. But in most of the world, if you have an Android phone, go on the Google Play Store this month, and on the, the, the games page, on the front page, there's a little picture of me! Tell no, people what games to get. Face. Get your groove on with Laura K. Buzz. I, I, I tell people all around the world, hey, these are some these are good games. You are a groovy chick. I'm a groovy chick. I was I was given a thing of like, hey, pick whatever games you like that are available on Android. Write reviews. We will not dictate what games you can talk about or what you can say about them. You have like a tweet length to do a little review. Tell people some games that you like that are on Android. Mm-hmm. And... That was a cool little paid opportunity thing I had, and uh, it's the trans agenda. I'm telling everyone what games to play. Spreading, spreading the world. Ah, uh, but those aren't the things I've been playing this week. I should probably get to that. No. I've been playing Delta Rune Chapter One again because that's that Toby Fox. Thing. It's that Toby Fox thing that's sort of. It feels like the Majora's Master Ocarina of Time of Undertale. Yes, it's it's not. Exactly a direct sequel, and there's a lot of familiar faces you're used to seeing, but they're not the people you knew them as. It's like, oh, I recognise that character. Oh, you're apparently someone else. You're not annoying, dog. What? Yeah. Um. So the the first chapter of Delta Room came out like three years ago. Um. I think almost exactly three years ago. Um. It was just put up online as like Toby Fox was like, hey, here's a little survey program to find out what you want you know, what you'd like to see from me next. And it was like a four or five hour long first chapter of a thing and it was available for free. And all of the later chapters were due to be paid experiences. And then this past week, Toby Fox was like, hey, chapter two, it's available like now and it's free because the last two years of pandemic have been really shitty and fuck it, have some have some free video game to make up for it because you've had a bad time and yeah. that was real nice. Um, I haven't gotten around to playing Chapter 2 yet because we had visitors and then we went away and now I've got work stuff. But I've been replaying Chapter 1 because it was three years ago it came out and I wanted to wow, remind me. really? Yeah, three years ago. That yeah, right. It really did just stop time, huh? It, it really did just sort of stop time a bit. Um, but yeah, I really like that first chapter of, of Delta Rune. I forgot how funny it is Mm. um the humor really hits a sweet spot for me um i'm very curious about where that chapter two is going and i'm excited to get there but like playing back through this first chapter there's a lot of things that i noticed that like given some hindsight i'm like i feel like this is probably relevant and narratively important Mm. um I'm currently redoing the optional, very tough boss fight. Like, there is a... The first chapter has a Sans-level, very tough, completely optional boss fight that you have to go uh, out of your way to do a side quest and find some really, uh, like, hidden away items to go unlock. Mm -hmm. And it's a really fun fight. It's got some cool little mechanics to it. I'm still practicing and getting better at it. Um... But in some ways it's tougher than the Sans fight, in that the Sans fight is very predictable. Um, The same attacks come in the same order with the same bullet hell patterns at the same times. Like, you can muscle memory some Mm -hmm. of the things. There's a lot more randomness Uh to the ways that, like, okay, it's going to be the firing projectiles at you this time, and then it's going to be the the carousel... But the way that things move within those patterns is unpredictable, oh. which is tricky. Um, but yeah, I I'm really I'm really digging it mechanically, and I want to get onto chapter two. Um, I saw like a minute or so of the start of chapter two while doing a raid over to uh, the lovely Comrade Zimmerman stream last night, and oh, it it it's th- some of the things I had wondered whether would be interesting. Uh, would be carried forward sure seem like they're going to be a focus at the start of episode two and i'm Mm -hmm. intrigued also there's a bit of a mystery that i'm in i don't know i don't know how to understand toby fox games (laughs) um the itch.io page and the steam page for delta rune 
both say chapter one and two available now for free chapters three to five coming in the future being developed now so i was like okay there's going to be five chapters if you boot up the game and look at the chapter select screen there's seven chapters listed and that's an interesting discrepancy Mm. i'm willing to believe the seven because seven is like it comes up a lot At the start of the game, they're talking about your brother being away for the next week, which is seven days. Undertale had seven human souls that were being collected. I feel like seven chapters make sense, but I'm like, why are you lying on the store page, Toby? What what you got cooking? I don't know how to trust you. Maybe things have changed from when they were written initially? Yeah, but again... Because he didn't have a team straight away, did he? Yeah, but the difference is... These were updated when chapter two went live. Oh, yeah. There wasn't a mention of how many chapters yeah, there would there be until be an chapter ARG two. Somewhere. I, I'm very curious what that means. Okay. Maybe it means nothing. Maybe it means everything. Maybe it was um, a typo. Who the fuck knows? But I'm really enjoying Delta Rune. It's real Yay. fun. Um, I, I'm excited to to have more of that to play. I'm gonna probably tomorrow I'm gonna start on chapter two, which is nice. Mm. What about you? What have you played? We played some Root, the <gasps> board game. We did. We played Root. We did. Uh I've been playing as the Woodland Alliance. Yeah. We played as the Marquis de Cat. I love playing as the Marquis de Cat. And we used the Electric Eerie from the Clockwork expansion. Yeah. So yeah. Um still fun Woodland times. Uh the Marquis de Cat have just taken over the uh forest and the eerie who have recently been deposed are not super happy about that they're trying yeah. to fight things back meanwhile you've got the woodland alliance who are desperately trying to um just generate some some goodwill amongst the people they're trying and to start create a rebellions. people's revolution yes yeah yeah they have got to generate some sympathy for the rebellion yeah. and then revolt narratively i would like the woodland alliance to win every time but also my army of cats is unstoppable cats everywhere i mean they're not unstoppable you did defeat the army of cats i did the first time yeah but not the second time no. although uh, i then went and played the board game uh, or the the digital board game yeah uh, on steam for a little bit and realized um there was a, a rule we were missing it, it, that was making you yeah. a little bit dopey yeah, I don't think it would have made a huge difference, but it definitely no. made a bit of a difference. No, yeah. I think generally the cats are the easiest to understand and also probably the most OP. They are the easiest faction to, if you underestimate them and don't get on top of them quickly, they can sort of yeah. snowball. They are the most consistently easy to play. But at the same time, from a like a three or four player point of view... Uh, if you start doing the thing where it's like, well, we better gang up on the cats because the cats are really dangerous. The electric, the the eerie, generally electric or otherwise, will fucking swoop in, yeah. and and uh, just the, take over. The birds are very good in a crowded environment. Yeah. The cats less so. Uh, mm-hmm. The marquee de cats realistically need as few obstacles in their way so that they can just sort of spread and drop things down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I continue to enjoy Root a lot. I love a bit of Root. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the Clockwork expansion is fun. It's also been good for... Because what we've been talking about is the fact that we know how to play it pretty much now. Um, but it would be difficult to teach because all of the factions play completely differently. Yes. Of the four that come in the base game, they they all play completely differently. So it's like learning... To do all those extra bits, like yeah. um, to to teach it, like I reckon fairly easily, I could now teach um, the cats and the eerie, no problem. Oh, agreed. But, which is why I'm sort of trying to, for myself, learn uh, the vagabond and the yeah um, the alliance, so that like if we had friends over, they could play cats and birds, and we could play yeah. alliance and vagabond. Indeed. But again, we also need to know how to teach those, even if we're not going to expect them to play them, so that mm-hmm. they understand what our wing conditions are and what they're trying to stop us doing. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not Ultimately, an easy Ultimately, everyone teach. is trying to get 30 points unless you're playing with the Dominion cards. Yeah. But it's, it's obviously un- important to understand what gets points, what are the benefits and things to look out for. Indeed, and the artwork for that is glorious. Even if you do keep referring to the, the Woodland Alliance mice warriors as toast... I stopped referring to them as bread. I I call them mouse now, even if they do look like bread. They look mice. like toast. They they are, but they do look like toast. But they little green mice. They are, but they do look like toast. 
I <laughs> What have you played? Uh, I started playing a little bit of Skatebird. Oh. Is that Skateboard in Bird's game? Yeah. Uh, I've not played a huge amount of it. Um, first thing of note, that game has so many customization options for your bird right out the gate that you don't need to unlock that are just available right from the start. Mm. Um, it's really easy to create like a very good custom bird. Uh, lots of different colours. I could have a little light blue little bird straight away. Yeah. But give them a mohawk. Give them some wraparound Is there a hawk shades. Tony? <laughs> I didn't look for a hawk called Tony, unfortunately. Um, you can give a little give give mine a little bum bag that can Aww. carry its stuff around in a little yeah. scarf. Yeah. Um, mechanically, it is pretty simple. Uh, it's a, it's a it feels a little bit floaty. Not in necessarily a bad way, but just. It doesn't have quite the uh, impact that something like, let's say you're playing a Tony Hawk or something, there's a very definitive feel of like a sort of hit feel as you start grinding a rail or you start doing, uh, make contact with stuff. It's missing a little of that feel. Okay. Um, and your birds feel a little bit s more susceptible to falling off the board than I would have expected. Oh, yeah. um, with the with the cute aesthetic of the game and the sort of silly, light-hearted nature, I sort of expected a little bit more forgiving than your standard skateboarding game. And if yeah. anything, it feels a little less forgiving, um, which uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not where my expectations were set for a game like this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm mainly just learning learning how to play and getting a feel for the controls at the moment. Um, I could do with the camera being a little further back. I need to look in the menu and see if that's an option because it, it feels like I'm a little close in to my skateboarding bird. Mm -hmm. um, I'm having I'm having a decently good time. Right now, I need to spend more time with it. I'm not entirely sold on it out the gate. Um, okay. But like, not a bad time, but there are little things that I'm like, will I get used to this or is this going to bug me? It's available on Game Pass, so there is that option. It is indeed. Yeah. Mm. If you want to give it a try, it's on Game Pass if you have Game Pass. Yeah. Um, what about you? What have you played? Ooh, we played Brew. <gasps> oh, we did. Tell us about Brew. Uh, so I mentioned Brew previously. I played through uh, Solo. You have uh, a bit of an area control game. You're trying to claim uh, areas of the forest. Uh, so you'll be uh, putting rolling dice, putting them in forest spaces to forage for various ingredients to brew potions. But also at the end of a round, if you've got more dice in there than anyone else, then you mm. will claim that forest uh, for your own. You're also training creatures that will give you benefits for yeah. things like uh, foraging, or you can spend dice on them to get extra bonuses. Yeah. All sorts of sort of various bonuses you'll get from them, so they're your sort of engine building aspects. Yeah. But you need to have forests to put the engine building animals in. Yeah, to you, get the, to so get some of their things. You will get more points by uh, releasing animals into the forests. Yeah, but you then don't get their abilities, so it's like okay, let's get the forests ready, and then it's a good, actually, quite a good way yeah. of like turning over. Um, characters, yeah, because you can just go right. I'm just going to train someone, and uh, just like just you can t churn through what's available in the shop, hmm. um, because you've got one of each season of creatures, so spring, yeah. summer, autumn, winter, and they will only go into matching uh, forests or of uh, that season, yeah, because there's apparently something with the seasons being out of whack at the moment. Uh, some of the times coexisting, so you might yeah. have a, a spring, autumn. Uh, forest that you can release a, sp a spring or an autumn animal into. Yeah. And it, it sort of encourages you picking up stuff that might not be useful to you generally because you're like, look, I've got a forest space open and it would be good to have something in there for points and mm -hmm. it, it keeps stuff churning over. Yeah, definitely. And then you've got the whole potion brewing uh, aspect where you are uh, potentially sort of getting yourself little bonuses yeah. with all the things you foraged. So it's like, yeah, you've been collecting mushrooms, you've got enough mushrooms. Okay, on a turn, I will reserve a potion recipe, mm. spend uh, part of my turn uh, brewing the potion, and then I can choose to drink it now or drink it later, depending on if I really need that bonus. Yeah. And any potions you've brewed, including ones you've drunk, at the end of the game are, are scored for you. Yeah. So yeah. 
it's it's a really neat little game. It is it is pretty simple on rules, mm-hmm. but there is enough complexity to have you doing a lot of like I'm going to stop and think about this before I act kind of turns. Yeah, and it's got lovely art too, very much in the style of um, Adventure Time. Yeah, and because you the, you have to go to specific spaces to do specific actions, there is a lot of stopping to be like, do I do this now, even though it's not the optimal time, or do I do it later but risk that the other player might pinch it and I won't be able to do it for a bit? Mm-hmm. Like, there's a, there's, there's a reasonable number of things to think about in a pretty limited rule set. Yes. Which is good, I enjoy it. Mm. What about you, you got anything else? Um, I started playing a game called Kenna Bridge of Spirits. Mm-hmm. Um, this has been shown off in a few PlayStation oh, uh, directs. Yeah, it's that really gorgeous looking, um, very, it looks like a Pixar film in a lot mm-hmm. of places. Um, you play this girl living in the forest, you've got these little blob pick mini creatures. Um, so the trailers were not lying, that game is visually gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um... <sighs> The problem is, is that it's incredibly simplistic and it plays things very, very safe. Yeah. Um, it feels like a game made by committee with the insistence that it try and be for everyone. Mm-hmm. And as a result, it feels like it's not doing anything unique or anything that it feels passionate about. Mm. Um, it's a lot of like... We're going to do this mechanic from this other game, sort of, because that other game does it, not because we've got anything interesting to do with it. It's very linear. Um, I don't want to do linearity. I I mean, there's linearity and there's, like, the degree of linearity I'm about to explain to you. Um, So in the trailers, there's a lot of, like, ah, you're doing a puzzle, you're getting your little Pikmins to help you do stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Those puzzles almost exclusively boil down to... Here is a statue. Here's a place a statue's got to go to. Get your Pitman to pick up the statue and take it to where the statue goes. That's the whole puzzle. Is um, that a puzzle? That doesn't sound very puzzly. I mean, the puzzle is less doing the thing. It's finding, like, okay, I have sort of a bit of a mazy environment. Where's the statue? Where's the place the statue goes? Okay, I found the two of them. Solved. I, I do it. Um... The balance of the combat's way off. Um, you go between enemies that like die in basically a single hit or two hits and basically pose no threat at all to incredibly hard boss fights with like no ramp up between. Oh dear. There's no in between, and the plot is just very. Hmm. It feels like it feels very paint by numbers, inoffensive. Like, it feels like it's treading water. Okay. Um, I really want to like this game, but it just... It feels... It, it's kind of got the same problem that The Last Guardian had. All looks in, and no substance. It uh, All looks and no substance, and it feels like a game that should have... That, that might have been okay a couple of generations of console ago. Oh, okay. But feels very out of date in terms of its design philosophy today. Mm-hmm. <sighs> It's a real disappointment, that one. That is a shame. I've Yeah, I've been hearing, like, over the last day or so, people being very disappointed in that. Yeah, it, it should have been a good sign when um, I inquired about review code and what I heard basically boiled down to, and seems to have been reflected by pre-release reviews, mm-hmm. um, that they're being very selective about who they're sending review code to. Okay, just hoping for people to be... Yes, people. That's the impression I get. The review the review codes that were sent out were sent to um, people that gave very positive reviews that don't necessarily reflect what the general consensus has been. Mm. And that feels perhaps... I, I can't prove anything, but it feels a little deliberate. Yikes. What about you? What have you played? Um, well, you played some Plat Clouds, Cloudspire with the version 2 update. So, I uh, ordered the, uh, basically just, I just missed the Cloudspire Kickstarter for version 2. Um, managed to find a reasonably priced, reasonable condition uh, version 1 available on eBay. And then uh, Chip Theory Games, who make it, issued a uh, an update pack. For about 15 quid. So I managed to get uh, all the new uh, instruction manuals, 
the uh, scenario book for solo campaigns and co-op campaigns and there's like a bunch of upgraded uh, chips for every faction so uh, like some there's been a little bit of rebalancing there's less chance now of almost any faction being completely overwhelmed by the birds because there's now a f like the lake's not overwhelming but there are now more overall units of hey i can deal with flying stuff yeah uh, i haven't tried playing the birds against anyone yet but uh we played uh the trees versus the elf people mm. um how did you find the the trees um i got i got on much better with the trees much 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 better with the trees mm -hmm. um because who was it what was the class called i played with before uh um, the i don't know the giants the giants um the giants felt very very uh reliant on a very very slow warm-up that if you were getting smacked down before you could get that engine going you just couldn't get anywhere mm -hmm. The uh, the trees feel infinitely more able to just be reactive, um, do things that are useful for them when it's useful for them. Like, you have a lot more control over when you deploy things mm -hmm. and deploying things mid-round and making decisions mid-game about what's going to be helpful rather than having to set it all up at the start of the wave. Mm. Um, I got on very well with that playstyle. Nice. Yeah. Um, I usually play as the birds, uh, or have previously usually played as the birds, and they tend to be very sort of quick, but a little bit glass cannony. Uh, they don't tend to have a lot of health, but usually they can swarm in such numbers that that doesn't really matter too much, hmm. especially if you're making use of the uh, grouping mechanic. Yeah. Whereby you can sort of like use one as a shield for the layer below them. Mm. And that's been helpful. Uh, this time I played as the elves who basically have this sort of mechanic where you can, rather than having to upgrade them, you can pick like any version of any chip you like. Yes. Right from the beginning. But they are very expensive. Yeah. And they give a lot of. Um, like reward points to your opponent. Yeah. I think once again, I feel like this this the more we play this game, the more I feel like it would play better in larger numbers. Yes. Uh by comparison as well, the the trees give very little reward to your opponent for defeating, which helps yeah. a lot. Yeah, that certainly helped. I like that there there were things on my board that were of virtually no use unless I could power them up fully. Yeah. It's like, okay, you have a dice. Like, there was one, it was like, spend three points to get a dice. Cool. That, what does that do? Well, that means that you now have this range limit. Okay. And then there's loads of other mechanics on your board that revolve around that range limit. Cool. I better get that then. And then, yeah. like, the first time you roll it, that's locked in that number. And it can only have a maximum. Oh wait, locked in for the whole game? No, nope, just nope, the... no, 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 oh, no. Okay. So you lock it in, and until you do the next update, you can't. Ha uh, you you have to stick with that number. So if you roll a one the first time, that's the best you get. Oh, that that's really the rough. next upgrade. I think is like four points. You get to re-roll it again. Once again, it can't be higher than um, I think it's like five. Mm. So the first roll can't be higher than three. The second roll can't be higher than five. Um, and the last roll is obviously the max that's on the die. It's a d6, but I think it goes up to, like, nine. Okay, yeah. Um, but, like, that's not to say that, say, the second time... You, if the first time you rolled it, it was a one. The second time it can... It has to be at least what it was before, but no higher than five. So you can re-roll uh, and get, like, say, a three. If yeah. you've got one... It's like, okay, well, now I'm at the most it would have been earlier. And that's still not great, and I still have to put points into other things to even make that relevant. Yeah, that seems like a real rough uh, hand to be dealt when it's like, hey, there's a... That feels like something where it should just be pay points to upgrade your range. Yep. Like, it doesn't feel like it should be randomised. Balance it for what the good numbers are. Right. Um, and then, like, there's things that, like, you would need to spend more points to be like, okay... So at the beginning of my turn, instead of loading everything up on my base, I'm going to put things in the rings, and then at, like once the round starts, I can teleport people out 
mm. within range plus X. And it's like, okay, that would be a lovely idea, but I never never had enough um like victory points or, or like money to spend in order to activate more than the first few things of that. Like eventually the only thing I could put my money into was um resurrecting everyone. Yes. Because that's a whole different aspect. Like usually everything all your chips go back into your uh like supply. Yeah, so that you can buy them on the next wave. Exactly. But with like with the elves, they just die die and they sit in the graveyard. And you have to invest a bunch of points into making them work like the other classes. So again, the first one is three and you can pay uh after that you can pay two uh like cash yeah. to pull one person out of the graveyard. The next one is four, which means that at the beginning of your turn, you can pull one person out of your graveyard for free. And the next one, I think, is another three. And at that point, you can um, pull uh, you can pull anyone out of your... Um, you put, pull everyone out of your graveyard. But that's yeah. like ten points you've already spent. That's, that's such a big investment just to get to the starting point that other classes are at for yeah. that. To undo a negative... Yeah, especially when you consider the fact that all of those things cost so much to get out in the first place. Yeah, it it feels like this class ha- has to have some kind of amazing big benefit we're not seeing that justifies the fact that you have all these negatives you're having to pay to undo. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think they argue that it is a case of you have access to all of them from the beginning, but you don't really, because you only have so much um, currency so currency to invest in what characters you put out each round. Mm. And like some, some of them are like starting at like seven or eight, which means you're not going to be able to get them out until at least the third round. Yeah. It's like, no, nah, this isn't helpful. Oh, um, but yeah, um, that's a very hard faction, but... Still, still, like, I want to put more time into Cloud Spire, but it is such an investment. Mm. Um, might, might consider trying the co-op missions at some point. Ooh, that'd be maybe fun. Maybe get into that. Yeah. Something to do together, and maybe sort of a group victory would make things a little bit better. I'd, I'd be very up for that. Yay! Uh, what have you played? Uh, I think that's about everything I've played. Have you played anything else? I played some Planetary Annihilation. Tell me about Planetary Annihilation. Uh, this was kickstarted, gosh, about seven or eight years ago, I feel like. Um, so it was, it was big at the time. I didn't kickstart it, but like a lot of people were talking about it, like, oh, it's one of those classic like RTS games, and uh, you're going to have the like these amazing zoom out abilities. You're going to be able to go from like uh, like a solar system view down to a planet view, Hmm. right down onto the planet, and look at individual things, and they'll be doing stuff. Yeah. You'll be able to, like, take off from, like, one planet and land on another moon, Hmm. and, like, send, send, like, things through, like, open teleporters to move things across. But the big selling point seemed to be, you can attach rockets to things... And launch them into other things. Like, Aha! You can launch a moon into another planet. That sounds great and fascinating and not at all overly ambitious. <laughs> um, yeah, which is why I was like, I am not kickstarting that. I, I hope it happens. I wish them all the yeah, best. Yeah, that's not a game I would trust a Kickstarter pitch for <laughs> until like it was out and okay. And Kickstart was fairly young at the time. Like, yeah. It, but, like, uh, as a lot of people say at the time, like, you are not buying a game, you are, like, you're not investing, you are helping to support people to try and get a thing, and you might get something at the end of it. Yeah. And I think what was worse with Planetary Annihilation that put me off it for so long was the fact that almost as soon as it was released, they released another version called Planetary Annihilation Titans, which uh-huh. had like, was, like, an expand own. So it had like loads of extra content. Yeah. Um and it's like, wow, that's a way to kick all the Kickstarter people. Yeah, Apparently they it. got it for free. Um Okay, that's something. And I ended up with Planetary Annihilation, I think in a humble bundle many, many, many years later. Yeah. And it has sat in my Steam library for a long time. Hmm. And after the disappointment of Off World Trading Company, I was looking for something a bit RTSE. And I was like, that I'll try that. Um, it's 
I've only really been through the, the tutorial. Uh, but it's got some, like, really cool modes in it. Like, the tutorial was really cool. Uh, there are, like, some pretty fascinating type, uh, like, ways of doing things. Hmm. Just, like, the first time you get to crash a moon into an, into an opposing Yeah, planet, that, that's a thing that works in the game that's, and yeah, it is works. as cool as it sounds. It's incredibly cool, like, you, because you, you, you set launch on it and maybe evacuate any of your robots that you've got down there, and then it's just like... Oh, this is this is taking a while. Is is every is everything okay? And you zoom out to the galaxy map. And it's like, oh yeah, it's just tracking around the sun so it can slingshot. <laughs> it's got a rocket on it, but what if it had like, like proper physics based stuff behind it as well? That's so neat. It, it's really very cool. Um, um, and yeah, it's like a whole thing when you blow up your uh, like opposing commander. There's the, like this big blue nuclear explosion thing. Mm. It looks cool as fuck. And apparently for people who own Planetary Annihilation, you can get Titans for, like, £2. Okay. So it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I look forward to getting back to that. But despite having taken a week and a half off of my day job, I have not had time for anything. Yeah, I know and that feeling busy, well. Busy, busy, bun, bun. Busy, busy beans. Yeah, busy bean. Um, anything else? Let me have a quick look. Ah, it's everything I've played, I think. I am Fish. I, we, I played some oh, Iron yeah. Fish. You came yeah. me through that on stream. That was a cute, silly game that suddenly got impossibly hard for no reason and stopped being fun. Yeah, so it went from being like, oh, very carefully uh, marble your fish around this area and, and sort of get them to new places and, and help them to help them escape back into the wild while humans keep picking them up and putting them in bowls. Putting them in jars and bowls and stuff. It's 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 a boss of studios game and they, you know, did I Am Bread, um, Surgeon Simulator. It feels in the vein of stuff like Octodad. It's one of those games where like it's ha ha ha, isn't it silly? That it's a little bit difficult to control and we've got a silly premise. The problem is, it oversteps that line from fun, silly, bad controls to, oh no, this is just, it's it's skyrocketed to impossibly hard for no reason and it's not fun. Yeah, the bit we got stuck on, or I got stuck on, was um, playing as the piranha. Mm. And, like, so there, there's, you've got to sort of jump over between bits of the river and there's, like, uh, rock walls in the way. Yes. And that's fine. And then you have to, like, jump out of the river, which the the jumping mechanic is, I found it at least, really difficult to get to grips with. Yeah. Because you've got to get enough momentum and be at just the right angle, especially if you want to do, like, the next bit, which is jump on, bite a bird, hold yes. on to the bird, and then let go when you're over the next bit of river. Mm. That was fine until the next bit thereafter, which was... And I, I'm, I'm saying this with authority, but I only think it's correct because I couldn't get it to work. Yeah. You, uh, so you get dropped off by one bird. You end up in a flowing river and the river is flowing over a waterfall into a separate pool. And there's a bird just above the waterfall on a branch. Yeah, so I think what you have to do is like leap out of the water to jump onto that bird, bite it and fly to the next area. Yeah. Because once you're in that pool, I couldn't find any way to get past. Yeah. There isn't a continue point down there, which implies to me that perhaps that it is best to go back. But for some reason, I kept bobbing back up to the surface no matter what else I yeah, did. Yeah, you couldn't get the jump to happen to get the bird. Yeah. And... It wasn't working. Yeah. yeah, and that was after the bit where the seagulls were attacking you, where for like 15 minutes it was oh. just trying to get across one bloody stretch of roof. Yeah, just repeatedly getting slightly stuck on one thing, and then slightly stuck on this oh. other thing, and then rammed backwards by a bird and having to do yeah. it all again. It... I immediately uninstalled it after the stream. I can't blame you. It, it, it went from silly, goofy, silly, but like with enough checkpointing um, and not too much difficulty that that was okay. To just yeah. out of nowhere, oops, it's impossible It now. went from sort of fun monkey ball to fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, that just isn't fun to me. So, Indeed. yeah, that was, um, that was I Am Fish. 
And I think the last thing I played was I played some um, Suburbia Collector's Edition. Ooh. Ooh. Um, so Suburbia is a hexagonal tile laying game. Yeah. You are uh, basically a city planner. Uh, you have a, a little board that starts with some suburbs and like a little um, like town administration type building mm. and a little heavy factory. Fine. <laughs> yeah. And basically you have a uh, a little row of things you can purchase. Mm -hmm. And you pick things up and they they depending on where they are in the row, they might have an extra cost attached to them. Mm. But maybe they're worth more and you want to stop your opponent from getting them. And you pick them up and they will have various bonuses. So you might get more reputation, which will help you get more population at the end of each round. More income, which was... You'll obviously need to get more, um, like, stuff later on. And uh, more population, which is basically points for the end of the game. Uh, but every time you get a certain level of population, you'll pass a little red roof on the score track. And every time you pass a red roof, you have to drop your income and your reputation by one. Hmm. So you have to be sort of careful how things are going with that. Yeah. Uh, because you can start sliding back down the scoreboard. But, like, basically it is just this fun little thing of, like, okay, I want to lay everything out and I want to sort of see what I can do to get the most out of things. Like, so things will be might be for every other um, industrial building in your tableau. Hmm. Or you might have things that are for every adjacent residential area, like say a fast food restaurant, you might get like extra income for that, yeah. depending on where they're placed. It's it's great fun, and the box is really intimidating. So it basically turned up, there was the box itself, and at the bottom was all of the punch boards. Yes. And I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's a lot of stuff, although it, it's... Nice that it's a bit smaller once you've taken all the punch board off the bottom. Yeah. But then you have to punch it out, and we um, maybe it's different if you'd played the like the base game of Suburbia before. Mm. But I got this. Like, okay, I have all these empty trays, and I have to sort of, I guess, work out where the fuck everything goes. Yeah, what things go together in which trays? Because there's like clearly things the right size for things, but like there's lots of pieces that are the same shape. Which ones go where? There are hundred, literally hundreds of hexagons, and like most of them have like A, B, and C written on the back. Yeah. Like, okay, well, I couldn't tell you which A, B, and C they go to. Like there are icons, but some of them have more than one icon. So it's like you're supposed to play this expansion. Only if you're playing this other expansion as well. Oh, one of those. Um, but, like, this is very... Especially uh, the convention tiles, which are, like... Here's a tile for Gen Con. And here's a tile for Dice Tower Con. Yeah. Uh, which is adorable, but also, like, you're really only supposed to play those with nightlife, as far as I can tell. Because they've got the little moon symbol. But they've also got a dice symbol... Because they're the, the, the con tiles. Yeah. So an intimidating first open for someone who doesn't have base game understanding. There, there is a video on YouTube that I had to watch to try and understand it. And I was still fucked up on something. <sighs> I still sat, I had to sit down and like literally count through every single one of, of ti the tiles in every group to try and work out why something appeared to be missing. Oh no. Yeah. I was like, I'm swear I'm missing a part. Oh no, it went in with something else because it has two different symbols on it. Ah. Ah. Um, I have now played through like a, a couple of uh, practice games with the uh, the AI. Um, there are f like two or three different ways of doing solo play in that game, mm. and I haven't even looked at the expansions yet. But it is fascinating. I've watched people online play through the the expansions. Nightlife looks fantastic. Um, like, what if you had like a house full of werewolves oh. uh, or, or vampire stuff going on as well as all the other bits <laughs> and maybe they interact. That sounds fascinating. And maybe the werewolves will be de killing off some of your population every turn. Oh no! But but also they give you a, a, other kinds of rewards. Yes. Oh, I'm excited to check that out at some point. I'm very excited to, to play some more of it. If only there was time. If only there was time. Well, there'll be more time at some point. At some point in the future, yeah. maybe. Maybe. 
Uh, Is that everything you've played this week? That's everything I've played this week. Well then, time for this. Oh, oh. Oh, what's up? Just look at the... Look at this person, right? They're pretty, they're, they're not pretty I, I, Do you ever have the thing where you, you just can't tell? Do I do I fancy them? Do I want to be them? A bit I, of both. I mean, I mean, mm, I mean, if you're having if you're having that experience, mm. I think the answer is you want to be them. You think so? I mean, if you're thinking you want to be be them, um. Be them. You think I could be them? I think you'd be them. You think I could do that? Yeah. With the tentacles? Yeah, with the tentacles. And the spider legs? Yeah. And the gaping maw? Exactly. You think let, I should... Let your dreams be dreams. Be them. I could... I, yeah, I mean, I could, you, you know, could be them. suck people into the void. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think... You know what? I think I will eat the dreams of men. I, I, I support you in your ambitions. Thank you. Good friend. <laughs> Right, everyone, everyone, I'm having a bit of trouble here and I need to get your input. Uh, what, what seems to be the problem? Well, see, the problem is, um, well, we spent years making making movies full of terrible, horrible villains in our animated features. Well, yeah, so you've got to have an antagonist, what? Exactly, exactly, and, you know, we made them as villainous as we could, yeah. gave them all of the villainous coding we could, we made, gave them yes. all of the villain attributes we could think of. Absolutely, absolutely. And decades later, um, gay adults are thirsting over them. Right, I mean, what, what do you think that's about? I, I, I don't know, but I'm going to lay it out for you. Uh, right. You know that the evil vizier, uh, there's, there's gay men who are calling him daddy and want to be want to be controlled with their mind with his magic staff well i mean that uh, that's like a whole like thing that people are into that's a that's a king but, but and also a... you we we did kind of uh, there is a certain amount of of queerness within that character I, I i don't know what you mean we gave them villainous attributes that villainous bad people have uh that's all we did i mean it was very specifically a time when we were expected usually by the government or various governing bodies around uh, the motion pictures and so forth that we did have to make sure that we were putting people in uh, uh. if they were if they were going to be any queer representation at all they had to be uh, portrayed uh. as not good so well, okay maybe we did that 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 once but like okay how do you explain this one uh the tentacled um a sea witch lady literally sea- based on a drag queen no, no. Yep, literally. No, no the she's a, a monster, d- d- evil. Um, yes, I heard. Steals voices. She's bad. Literally based on a drag queen. I. It's right. It, I mean, I can take you back to the production crew. They are still available it, to ask about it. And is, uh, is that it's why they're widely documented <sighs> based on a drag queen? Is is that why they're posting? Big mommy milkers on all the posts about her. I and mean, then she does have quite big mommy milkers. I mean, she does have big, quite big mommy milkers. Also, you know, the tentacles. Do you think perhaps, just perhaps, yes. um, our attempt to make homosexuality seem um, unappealing accidentally had the undesired effect? Was it undesired or have we just, you know, have we just made a whole generation of people who will lust after... Uh, the the things that you, we've tried to convince them are bad and evil. I mean, it's the only gaze they got, I guess. It really is the closest we managed to representation. Maybe we could do better with trans people. Oh no, of course, brother of heavens, no. Ah, okay, more trans villains then. Exactly. Don't want to lose out those Russia bucks. So, <gasps> what have you put in your eyes? Your eyes? What have I put in my eyes? Um. I watched a YouTube video called I Wonder Traded 1000 Pokemon by a YouTuber called Candy Eevee. Ooh. Um, it, the video is very much what it says on the tin. Um, this this YouTuber who presents themselves with a sort of cartoon avatar while d- yeah. doing storytelling. Um, for anyone who's not done wonder trading in Pokemon, it is the thing where you send a, send a random Pokemon out into the ether and you get a random Pokemon back mm-hmm. uh, that someone else in the world is wonder trading. Um, and how many caterpies did they get? I well, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the results were kind of interesting. Um, 
so as someone that's done a lot of wonder trading like there's a there's a lot of what you would expect occurred uh they split their wonder trading across like a couple of different generations of game um and in the more recent generations of game um you've got a lot more mm, how, how do i how do i separate this out in the older games, you've got a lot more of that kind of thing. You've got people just wander trading for, uh, here's a Caterpie I caught on Route 1 and was just throwing out. The more modern games, you get less of that, and what you get more of is, um, hacked shiny Pokemon whose names are the names of the websites where you can buy sh hacked shiny Pokemon. Um, unchangeable names, by the way, so it'll be very clear if you keep it, like, oh, look at this shiny I have. Why is it called pokeyshinies.com? Mm. Um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of that. But what was much more interesting um, was the Pokemon that were received that very clearly didn't fall into those camps, that were like, this is someone's level 90 gold bat that has a nickname that's clearly like, oh, th that has like a, a league ribbon. You completed the Pokemon League with that. You, uh, you know, clearly liked it enough to give it a name. Mm. Like, wh why did you get rid of it? Um, a lot of them are clearly Pokemon that were used in Nuzlocks. You see a lot of like, oh, you... Some of the some of them are called things like Wonderlock, which is a a specific type of Nuzlocke where every now and then you have to do Wonder trades, and mm -hmm. whatever you get, that's what you have in your party now. Ooh. It was interesting seeing the Pokemon that very clearly seemed to be like, oh, this one has been transferred from like generation to generation to generation, and then you Wonder traded it away. Why did you do that? No idea. Um. Ooh. There was fun seeing how many times the same Pokemon returned back to that one person. Um, in the older generations of games where there's fewer people wonder trading, mm -hmm. um, the person doing it nicknamed all of her... It was all shiny... Ma it, it was all regular Magnemite. Mm -hmm. She just traded a lot of Magnemite with the same nickname she gave all of them. Mm -hmm. And in the older generations, every probably four or five trades should get one of her own Magnemites back and... Mm. It's like, okay, that's clearly someone on the other end who, whatever they receive, they're like, don't like it, sending it back. Mm. Um, and the very limited pool was just passing these Magnemite around a bit. Okay. Um, but yeah, there was a, there was some really interesting... So was it like 100 per generation? or? Uh, I think it was about 300 per generation over okay. the last three gens, I think, was, uh, yeah, like 333 per gen. Mm -hmm. But... Oh, it, it was a really interesting video, and some of the stat breakdowns at the end of, like, which um, which generations of Pokemon were most commonly traded. Um, there was a lot of, like, okay, how many of these are level one Pokemon that were clearly uh, bred trying to breed shiny Pokemon and they're all little egg babies? Mm -hmm. um, what percentage of them are clearly um, breeding for stats, if you look at them? There's some really neat breakdowns of what sort of stuff circulates on mm. Wonder Trade. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a good video. Trade. What about you? What have you watched? Uh, I watched a video called um, Mario 64 RTX On mm -hmm. by Hulopi. Uh -huh. Did you watch this? I did. Yes. And what did <laughs> you think? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I watched it. That's what I thought. Uh, so Hulopi makes... Uh, really amazing uh 3d and um mostly 3d art like or uh like cool camera effects uh he did one that's basically like a kickflip that lasts forever sort of jumps up in the air and the board is just sat spinning beneath him <laughs> while he just hangs in the air um does lots of like green screaming and green screening himself into weird things he's made a couple of music videos mm. um how to dubstep is amazing oh i've seen that how to dubstep yeah. one yeah i didn't twig that was the same person same person um yeah. yeah and and he's done this mario 64 with rtx on <laughs> what if how how good would mario 64 look if you turn the rtx on yeah. And the the title screen is obviously Mario's face in incredibly high detail, uh -huh. um, with a bit of a a, a, a bleeding nose, uh, and he seems to be very into the idea of having his nose pulled around a bit more. <laughs> and before you know it, Hulopi himself has been sucked into the the castle, where yes. Toad has turned into something out of the Twin Peaks Red Room. <laughs> That all said, jokes aside, you can play Ray Traced uh, Mario 64 thanks to that source code leak in the PC port. You can. You can, pay, you can play Ray Traced Mario 64. It's, um... But you're not being chased by a, a, a 
No. A very angry no. Mario. Clearly this the source code PC version's wrong. Yeah, there must be must be something. Must going be a on. glitch. It must be, oh I think there was a glitch. <laughs> oh boy howdy. Uh yeah, definitely give that a look if you'd like something a bit weird. Yeah. Uh, what about you? Uh, I watched a couple of other YouTube videos, uh, yes. both from uh, Tom Scott on YouTube. Ooh, I like Tom Scott. Yeah, uh, I watched one about why California's musical road sounds terrible. Um, a musical road? Yeah, so it's a road that's built with uh, grooves and bumps in the road, um, and the maths is like, hey, you move at this speed, that makes the air vibrate at this speed. If we separate the bumps this far apart, it should make vibrations of this frequency, which should make notes. And... Uh, it's meant to play Paco Bell's Cannon. And they made this road twice, and twice it didn't sound right, and they couldn't work out why it had gone wrong. They made it, it didn't work. They made it again, it didn't work. And the short version is that it came down to a linguistic error between uh, the person who designed it and explaining it to the people who built it. Right. Uh, there's a precise distance apart these bumps have to be. Yes. The designer, when he gave the lengths, was explaining the length from the centre of one bump to the centre of the next bump. Right. The people who made the road were doing the e the end of one bump to the start of the next. So it's backwards? No, it's uh, it, it just means that all of the distances are half the width of a bump off. Oh. And because, like, that would Does be... Does that not make it, like, too fast or something? No, because that's the interesting thing. If you were to have the gaps all be a, cons a consistent percentage too large or too small, it would sound sped up or slowed down. But because they're a consistent amount too large or too small but the gap you're making too large or too small is of differing amounts. Oh. Each note is a little faster or a little slower than the note before or after it, oh, no. depending on the note. Oh, no. Yeah. So, like, in theory, if you'd make a yeah, if you made a mistake, you know, from the centre of one bump to the next, it would have been too fast or too slow. It would have been fine. It completely fucks it up. So are they going to try a third time? Or? Nope. They after the second, the council was like, "No, nope, not fucking doing it again." Um, so it, the road still exists. It's in the middle of the desert in California. You can go drive over a, a massively, battle? massively out of tune, not correct Taco Cannon Bell's indeed? Cannon on the on the road. Well, uh, and the other one I watched was called Str Three Strange River Crossings. Ooh. Um. And it is about a bunch of crossings of a specific river in the UK mm -hmm. that um, basically when the land either side of this river was bought up hundreds of years ago, um, in order to get agreement from the landowners to buy it, there were a couple of agreements made like, hey, um, you've got to keep the boat running across this stretch of river so we can get to the other side of the field, because at the time cars weren't a thing, it was going to be forever to get around the river. Um, and there were these little agreements that made sense a few hundred years ago that are still enshrined in law. That are things like, there has to 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, be a boat available to cross this river and someone to take you across the river for a price of 12 pence that has never risen with inflation. Uh, like, there's, there's some interesting stuff about why, like, okay, surely it would make sense to just get rid of those laws at this point because it's got to be more expensive to operate these things than the income they make mm. and the short version is that there's some interesting stuff about property law and management companies that own it and whether it's worth their while to fight to change those laws versus ah we're a big property developer we can afford to lose money running a weird boat that no one cares about it's a really interesting little mm. video what about you? What have you watched? Uh, we watched a video together. What did we watch? Uh, we watched uh, Understanding the Black Parade by Twelve Tone. <gasps> Interesting video. Yeah. Even if I don't necessarily agree with his interpretation of the 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 lyric uh, the lyrics and what their purpose in the overall narrative. Okay. Suggests. So to clarify, Twelve Tone makes um, musical breakdown videos. Yeah. Uh, like just like explaining. Like what notes are being yeah. used, what these mean in like music theory and classical music, yeah. how it's being put together to make the thing oh, you're hearing, uh, like running themes, like motifs, yeah, like the all the things that make up the music and what it do. Mm. And he's it does like these videos of like drawing mostly elephants, <laughs> and and sometimes Legend of Zelda references. 
spend occasionally yeah. Shrek doing little doodles while he explains doing music. little doodles and occasionally and he does it all on uh, staff paper as well so yeah. like when he does need to switch over from drawing elephants <laughs> to uh, like actually like doing notes or, yeah. or even drum notation which I recently learned to read yeah. that's fascinating um, to, to like uh, to break those down in really interesting ways yeah um, his his yeah. breakdown of the music was fascinating, and I very much appreciated it. And I think largely, I I I can see what he's he's getting at lyrically. I personally disagree with some of the lyrical interpretation, but I think you that... had to run off straight afterwards. So tell me what tell me what tell me what you think. Uh, I mean, my my main difference is um I I have some differences in how I interpret um. The he seems to think that the the end of the song is very re- resigned, very willing to to give up and like okay, I'm gonna go off uh, go off and stop fighting, mm-hmm. and he seems to resign. Uh, he seems to put all of the no, I'm defiant, I'm gonna keep living into famous last words. I would disagree. I think that um, welcome to the black parade has a a, a part has some of that defiance. I think that it is. Not necessarily as certain a defiance, but I think it is, no, I'm not ready to go yet. I, I don't know when I'll be ready to go, but I'm not quite there yet. Mm. Um, whereas his interpretation was a lot more, I'm giving up, I'm I, I'm not going to fight anymore. Mm. Which, like, yeah, I, I disagree a little bit, but I think that even with like my differences of how I would interpret the lyrics, I think that his interpretation of the music and what it's doing definitely still stands up and... Mm-hmm makes sense with how I understand the lyrics. I can understand why he has come to that conclusion based on what he has said about the um the snare roll. Indeed, yeah. Let's see my interpretation of the snare roll at the end was always that it was the the, the marching band like leaving that like the, the the reason it's getting quieter and quieter is he's not going with them. The marching band is leaving without him. Um, um was always my read on that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um but again these things are all open to interpretation. Neither of us is inherently right or wrong, but only Jared knows for sure for certain. Indeed, but I, I, yeah, it was very interesting seeing what's being used with music to make those sounds. Yeah, um, and it's uh, always it's always a bit eerie when someone's used like something or other to pull um, the lyrics out of a track. Yes, because there's always something slightly off about how how the the sounds you lose some of the um, a, a depth li- of of the, a little bit, the voice yeah. but uh, but just to hear it in isolation it's like yeah that's that's very cool yeah i i've i've always really appreciated that track for the the very thing he was praising it for the steady layering of additional mm-hmm. elements over time to really build to crescendo the wall of sound um yes and then knowing when to drop layers to mm-hmm carry the momentum of that track yeah i yeah. mean when i did the riding north track recently that was all about like layers and layers and layers, yeah. and, layers and layers and layers and layers until it just did literally become just a wall in my yeah. door and it's stuff about like oh it's that refrain from early in the track but now it's starting to fall apart a mm-hmm. little bit and i was like yeah i, I can see that oh yeah well then. uh have you watched anything else oh, i think that's everything i watched this week well then <gasps> time for this <laughs> new sponsor who's our new sponsor well do you sometimes do a thing and then you're like uh that's just that's the how that's how thing do that's normal i mean i've, I've done that in the past that's I've, normal that's the thing i mean i mean i remember back in my teen years assuming that everyone that was amab secretly wanted to just wake up as a girl uh the next day because they're just inherently better and nicer, and that that the like, well, who wouldn't want that to happen? I remember having the assumption that that was just a thing everyone thought. I mean, that seems reasonable. That's a perfectly it, reasonable thought. It it what it wasn't a thing that everyone thinks, but I thought that was a thing everyone thought. I mean, I I can understand why you thought that because I was very similarly inclined yeah. as a youth. Yeah. So yeah, like well. What if there was a website you could go to, uh, and if you you ever start to doubt any of those things, yeah, you could just be like, is that a thing? Is is this a thing that everyone is this 
is it, does everyone thing? do this? You know, does everyone, you know, uh, have you always assumed that um, when people say that they can picture things in in their mind, in your mind's eye? But that's a, it's a weird turn of phrase, doesn't, it's not literal, it's not a real thing, right? Uh, well, I mean, if you go to the website, you can check, but uh, no, that's, that, that, that's Oh, I'm fan- checking the website now. That's and, our fantasia, um, that. Oh, that's our Fantasia, that is. Mm, um, mm. Uh, well, have, have you ever ever assumed that, like, everyone can hear the sound of electricity in the that lights? Buzz. Yeah, that buzz of the electric, and it mm-hmm. kind of makes you want to cry or get overwhelmed. Yeah, it's a bit much, especially when you're already Yeah, you've assumed that everyone thinks that. Do, uh, is that not the case? Because I'm, I'm looking it up on the website. That's that's autism right there. That's an autism. That's an autism right, right there. Yeah. That's not just the state of being for everyone. There is a whole website now. Does uh, everyone experience this at dot com dot lol dot net? Uh, and and you can check out if the thing that you have always thought was the case, it, the fact that you can make the ears rumble. Oh, is that not normal? Nope. No. Nope. Oh. Only some people can can do oh, that. Oh, that's not a thing everyone can do. Yep. Ah, oh. like there's a lot of people that can do it, but not everyone. Well, I'm 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 excited to learn. Did your more. thumb do that? No. Yep. My, mine doesn't do that. No. Ninety degrees in both directions. Oh. Yep. Only one thumb though. Weirdly. Ah. Oh. Thought that was a thing. You assumed everyone could do that with that thumb, but no. Nah. Little toes on sideways? Ah, well, I mean, there's so many things we can look up with this website. Right. Turns out these are all things that are, that, that are not necessarily... Not, not necessarily case. everyone experiences, yeah. and maybe maybe Google some terms that we'll give you. Yeah. Uh, so that is does everyone experience this? .com.lol.net and enter the code QNPS182... Rising inclination? Question mark? Question mark? <laughs> and, um, yeah, just tell them we sent you. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Go on. Inside the boardroom of Electronic Actor Softworks. Hi. Hi. So, yeah. Uh, Things have been a little bad recently. Yeah. People are not happy with us. Yeah. That is um, bad for our money, and I yeah. like money. Years and years of us doing terrible, terrible things have finally mm. caught up with us, and people are starting to associate our name with all of the bad things we've done. Like, you Google our company name, and people don't say mean things. Yeah, that's why we took the name off the most recent launch of our game. Indeed, and we've been taking it off of more and more things, and I I think there's a solution to this. I think there's something we can do that might get us back on track. Right, right. What if we rebrand? Ah, it's because, that time again, is it? Yeah, yeah, because like... We've absorbed enough companies and, uh, We just pick you know, one of the names we absorbed, you know, yeah. and, you know, it, it, when people Google search our name, you know, nothing bad will come up because we haven't done anything bad as them yet. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, laundering of some sort. Yeah, exactly, some kind of laundering. So yeah. I've, I've been working on a... I've been working on a name. You, you're sure, ready sure. to hear what this. have you got? What have you got? Supremacy Software. Oh, I like it. I know, right? It it's, really, you know... Uh, really suggests that we're at the top and everyone else is beneath us. Yeah, I mean, that is pretty much how it is. We've bought, like, uh, most of the other uh, companies around. Uh, we love to, you know, like, absorb people. And we are supreme beings ruling over the entire game. Exactly. Uh, we are unassailable. We are Supremacy Software. We are supreme. I like it. I uh, like it. I am ready to start doing bad stuff all over again under a name that doesn't yet have baggage. With a completely clean slate. You are a fucking genie. I know. So, <gasps> what have you put in your ears? What have I put in my ears? I've put some music in my ears, a few new bits of music. Um, music. I listened to Brave as a Noun by AJJ. Uh, sort of a folk punk track about wishing you were brave enough to make a, more of an impact and sort of being, not being afraid of the personal risks that making a difference can come along with. Yeah. Uh, I listened to a track called Manic Pixie Dream Girl by the band She's. Uh, it's a sort of pian- piano-driven somber melody about not wanting to get roped into having to fix men's mental health problems for them because you're a free spirit and they've decided that means you're going to fix and save them. Um, yeah, that's a thing. 
I listened to a couple of tracks I just haven't listened to in a long time because they came on when we were we were out mm -hmm. uh, in Leeds the other day. Um, listened to Good Charlotte's The River. Um, oh, yeah. That's a real good catchy track that I haven't heard in probably a decade. But... I have some good tunes playing in there. That was Geek Retreat in Leeds. Yeah, Geek Retreat in Leeds. They had some good tunes. Uh, the other one that I heard and got very excited about, because no one ever plays it, because it's a weird B-side that's not on an album, uh, My Chemical Romance is Boy Division off of uh, Conventional that's Weapons. Boy Division. No! Huh? If, if all the enemies threw a party, would you light the candles? Would you drink the wine and watch the television? Is it Boy Division. It's 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 off conventional weapons and it's a good track yeah. and I was very excited to hear it in the wild. I was like, mm, someone's got some good taste in here. Um, I also listened to some Chumbawamba. I listened to some Chumbawamba. I listened to Tub Thumping. Uh, I listened to Tub Thumping and then I I also listened to some different things. I listened to uh, two tracks that were uh, packaged together as a single. Mm -hmm. um, Homophobia. And the day the Nazi died. Um, so a Facebook post alerted me to the fact that Chumbawamba, not just tub thumping band, you know, we get knocked down, we get back up again. They do that. Um, they do that. Uh, fun fact, that's a song about the Troubles, which in hindsight makes sense. <laughs> um, they were a big, big, like, anti-fascist, pro-LGBT, um, anti-Thatcherism, mm -hmm. uh, anti-right-wing band that, like... It is amazing that I never knew that, and they have some fascinating music that blends like traditional sort of more upbeat pop sound with some like genuinely quite progressive um, anti-fascist sentiments. Mm -hmm. um, the one that caught my attention was on the day the Nazi died, which is a song explicitly about the fact that history far too often wants to pretend that uh, Nazism died off with the end of World War Two in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And this song is very explicitly about, like, no, Nazis are still around. There are still people who believe in those same ideals. They may not always call themselves Nazis. Sometimes they will. But they're out there, and they are doing harm to people, and they are just waiting for a chance to do more harm. And let's be honest, the world's not going to be safe until every Nazi's dead. And I'm like, hell yeah. Did not expect Chumbawamba... Um, you know, vouching for violent opposition, like physical violence opposition to Nazis. I'm very happy that that exists. Hmm. Um, weirdly surprised that there has never been any covers of that track that I can find online. I was like, I kind of am in the mood for like like a, a punk as an audio genre like cover of this. Couldn't find any covers in any genres of this Something song. Something a bit aggier. Yeah, I fancied a slightly aggier version of this, and I know that like they're deliberately trying to contrast the tone and the lyrics, but also I kind of I kind of just want to ang angry this because it's lyrically great. Mm -hmm. Um, fun fact: they recorded an album that they kept completely like they recorded it years before Thatcher's death, um, and people could pre-order it, and they were like, "The day that Thatcher dies, we will send you our anti-Thatcher album that we mm -hmm. have created." Um. They had they had an anti Thatcher celebrate the death yeah, of Thatcher. They had a celebrate the death of Thatcher album. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, singing like very upbeat songs about how much like all of the terrible things Thatcher did and how thankful they are she's fucking dead now. Mm -hmm. Um, that they released on the day she died. Um, Homophobia is a track from the mid nineties that talks explicitly about um, the fact that like aggressive, insecure, um, middle aged white men. Um, are largely the driving force behind homophobia and um, are actively dangerous and need to be combated on that front mm. because gay people will not be safe until um, they can be safe from the threat of aggressive men who are not secure in themselves going and beating up gay men on the street. Mm -hmm. um, they're a good band. I've been listening to more Chumbawamba. They're real good. Nice. Yeah. Uh, what 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 about you? What do you uh, listen to? Um, mostly like demo scene and crack tro music. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Magnus Danielson on YouTube um did an uh just under an hour of late eighties Amiga demo music. Hmm. And it's all those sort of like we've cracked a version of this game and we've done our own intro on in the beginning of it and it's just. Like key gen music, it's good yeah, yeah. like mod type stuff. Uh, we listened to the Event Horizon score. Oh, we I did. had forgotten that Orbital were involved in that. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, in fact, I haven't seen that film probably since like two years after it came out. Don't know why. 
I remember it being good. I don't know why I haven't gone back to it. Probably that's, should at some point. Sometimes that's just the way. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's a really good album. Yeah. Um. And today I've mostly been listening to while I am doing a thing. A thing Wink. that, like, very, very soon you'll know what what's going yeah. on with. I mean, there might even be hints about it in this very episode. Ooh. Uh, today I've been listening to C64 Crackthrow Marathon, The Big Daddy 12 Hours. Ooh. A 12-hour Crackthrow Marathon uh, on the uh, Zeus Daz, <laughs> uh, the unemulated retro games uh, channel on YouTube. It's 12 hours of crack drum music. It's it's good chip tune. Om nom nom, yeah. tasty chip tune. Made me want to make some more chip tune. Yay! I don't have time for music. I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, lots lots of music, but mostly good good chippy stuff. Uh, the main other thing I've been what, uh, listening to is I've been re-listening to Dice Funk. Um, ah, I listened to I caught up with Dice Funk recently. Yeah, I I <laughs> listened. Decisions were made. I listened to the most recent episode of Dice Funk because <laughs> um, I recorded it like three weeks ago and have been afraid to listen to it mm. because all oh, mm, decisions were made. Mm. I made decisions. Mm. I hope that they are looked back on um, positively as good storytelling decisions. When the season is done. Drama, drama, drama. I, I made choices and I cannot be called a coward. No, I think it certainly um, made me want to find out what happens next. Yeah. Um, th- that made me want to go back and listen to season six of Dose Monks. I've been re-listening to some of that, uh, which is the the one with Nifix, the little game, yeah. gamer that goes on a journey. Um, I really like when I tell stories that piss people off. I'm really <laughs> proud of the stories I tell that, like, in the moment piss people off and then afterwards people go actually that was a real good story. I think that's the problem sometimes with the the serialisation of it. Yeah. That people will go, in the moment they have every, they, they've got a whole week to get really angry about something. Whereas yeah. I think when you can sit down and uh, just, like, marathon a whole thing, I think the people who come to it later and get to listen to the whole thing in one go will probably take that as just the oh my god drama moment rather yes. than the what the fuck did you do? Yeah. You <laughs> I demand not... answers on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Like listening back to some of the Nifix stuff, I'm really proud of the 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 points at which I moved that narrative along and yeah. where I took it. I think I did a really good job with it and I hope that in a very different way I my season eight performance will be seen the same way. I think Austin gave you uh, all the, the space you needed to tell a really fascinating story with season six, and and I I I hope that the audience will trust. Yeah, that season eight is going to be the same. I've given room in season eight for someone else to do something really interesting, yeah. and. I think that it is worth me doing what I've done to make sure that they have room to take the story in the interesting direction that they want to take it. I agree yeah. with the where, where they're looking to take it, and I'm willing to help them get there. I think it makes sense, given the story that, that Season 8 is about. Yeah, Season 8 has very explicitly, like, it didn't start this way, but it became a series about, a season about this whole thing. And... Well, I mean, it's it's very all of you. Like, yeah, you are the people that would tell that story. Yeah, there's I I can't think of another actual play D and D show that would tell the story we're telling. And oh, give it six months, someone will start telling it. Oh god, yeah, no, <laughs> it's the the dice funk. Qu- no, give it like two weeks and someone will oh, start okay. telling it. I thought I figured they'd probably want to leave it till the end of the series so that they could. Oh no, you'd jump be you'd it. be surprised. Um, how I figured they want to he- hear the end of the story before they started trying to tell it themselves. Oh no, they'll they'll. <laughs> I'll jump on anyway. It's it's happened before. Oh yes. <laughs> but yeah, that's everything I've listened to this week. Well then, <gasps> time for this. Releasing next week, it's Have I Got Surprisingly Anti-Fascist Bands For You. It's a selection of all your favourite upbeat, light-hearted bands of decades past that was sort of a little bit of a joke, but you didn't know were pro-LGBT, pro-LGBT rights, anti-fascist and generally progressive. With hits from Chumbawamba, The Venga Boys, 
and Smash Mouth, among many more. Available now on a 15 disc set. Call 1 800 Antifa. That's 1 800 Antifa and get your set today for just 19.99. Have you ever wanted to kick Hitler in the shins? I could go for that. Punch Reagan in the throat? Oh, yes, please. Or cover Captain James Irving in hot curls. Oh, that sounds delightful. Come on down to hell. Uh huh. We're offering people a chance to pop down to hell and punish some of the worst people who ever lived. Oh, just a little day trip. Just a little day trip. Come and see the sights. And, you know, get some satisfaction by punishing the wicked. Oh, you have no idea how deep I'm going to jam this into Margaret Thatcher. Come down to hell. It's a hell of a good time. Questions, Sam. Uh, let's have a questions. What's the questions? Uh, Samuel West asks, when will this day end? Uh, at, midnight. At, at a, yeah, midnight. Yeah. Like 11.59.59. Oh, day's ended That's now. That's it. Hello, are you good? Yeah. Free, free from this day. <laughs> Uh, Future Fishy asks, how cute is that there James Stephanie Sterling IRL on a scale of 1 to 10? Are they great or perfect? Uh, they're definitely perfect on the great or perfect scale. Uh, ten, 10 out of 10 would be in the vicinity of cuteness again. Mm -hmm. Very strokeable. Very strokeable, very, very huggable. Very very good, very good hugs. Mm -hmm. Very, very cuddleable, very good. Mm -hmm. Yep, 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10 would cutie again. Mm -hmm. uh, Phoenix 2, hi Phoenix, love you. Hello. Uh, have you had some water? I've had some blackcurrant squash. I had some water earlier. I've got some blackcurrant squash now. I, I had a, a nice coffee. Does that count? It's got water in it. Yeah, the ice was certainly water at some point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have you had kisses? <gasps> yep. And I Slightly head bite your glasses. It's fine. I now have a nose print on my glasses. I was I was over eager. There was a kiss offered. There was a kiss. Um, I'm a gay, I can't resist them. Have you had affirmation that you are soft and beautiful and good? You are You're soft, soft and, and beautiful, beautiful and, and good. good. Uh, yeah. Also, Phoenix says that you are soft and beautiful and good. Me? You are soft and beautiful and good. Uh, in which case, Fee, yeah, uh, no, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> also, you are soft and beautiful and good. Pet, pet. Pet, pet. Ha, 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 ha. This is recorded, you can't tell us back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tricky. Hi, Tricky. Also, thank you for the card. It was beautiful. Oh, it was lovely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, right this instant, the light goes off. The floor vanishes. The two of you fall into a fantasy Deltarune world. <gasps> Every object in your immediate vicinity. Fucking hell. Oh, fuck. <laughs> uh, becomes an anthropomorphized character in a heroic story. There's a lot of animals. Uh, there's a lot of items in my immediate vicinity. My desk is a bit cluttered. Yeah, I'm worried about the Come Face game for a start. Oh no, Come Face game is is an, an, an anthropomorphized character. Also, tiny blue bear. Tiny blue bear. There's the so, octopus. The octopus in the hat. Yeah, the octopus in the, the oversized the train, train hat. Octopus hat. Uh, there's a unicorn. There's a, a, a warming unicorn. Several living a video game bunny. controllers. Yep. Uh, the microphone comes to life. Ah! Ah! Uh, oh, uh, you've got the um the oh god, what was the game? The Atlas Space Star. Oh, Link. Starlink. Yes. You've got, you've got the Starlink ships. Ah, oh, little Starlink ships coming to life. <gasps> Many headphones. My patches from <sighs> Life is Strange: True Colors come to life. The Lego trains. Sleepy oh. Charizard. This is quite quite the menagerie this we have. This is going to be an amazing story. Yeah, I want to play this story now. Lego bonsai tree, uh, but like a wise old bonsai tree oh. that tells you things. Ah. ah. But also, ah, we ah. fall into this world and the cinnamon toast trunk crunch is coming to get us. <laughs> and the shoes, there's an army of shoes. Oh no. No, wait, wrong universe. <laughs> um, you, that's that's a wild story that's about to evolve. Which one's the boss? Do you think? Oh, I think the cute, adorable little bear on the desk. <gasps> cute, adorable little yeah, bear. Yeah, I think could... I think they're secretly a much tougher boss fight than you would imagine. Oh heck. Yeah. Oh, I played Life on Pacifist, but it didn't go well for me, so I'm gonna be a genocide bear now. No, genocide. Bear, you gotta no. convince them back to pacifism. I'll keep complimenting them and hope for the best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Callum Turner asks, "Do you have ways to combat mental exhaustion from a day job?" When it comes to doing creative side project after work? Um, for me, the main thing I do is I try and do lots of different creative projects so that 
I'm never doing one project that I'm burned out on too long. You don't have a day job, so... I mean... Your day job is the creative job. Yeah, I I keep myself from getting burned out from one creative job by doing the other creative job. Um, I mean, when I was doing day job and doing creative stuff as well, the important thing was to try and give myself some time off where, like, I wasn't using every minute I had to do the creative things Mm -hmm. to be like, hey a few hours at the weekend where I'm not working, like to try and get out of that headset of feeling obligated to work 24 seven when I wasn't at day job. Mm-hmm. Um, I no is my answer. I don't have any ways. I just, uh, get more and more stressed and will shortly burn out. No doubt. Oh, no, 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 no burn out. I love you. I love you. Don't please, please don't burn out. I love you. I will. I will try not to. Okay. Uh, lost penny asks favorite nail polish colors. Oh, light blue. <laughs> no, sure yeah. not. Blue, you? Yeah, me. <laughs> I've always thought about you more of a beige. Nah. nah. Uh, I like black. Black. Ooh, yeah. Black always looks good on me, I think. It mm-hmm. contrasts well with the bright colours. Yeah. Uh, neon pink and black, like combo colours. Like a purple. Ooh, I like for a good deep purple. A good deep purple spark. But if it's got like a like oh, yeah, kind of or something, yeah. a bit of sparkle. Um, red. Everything's red at the moment. I'm yeah. wearing a lot of red, and like just multicolors. I wore multicolors for the for the wedding. Um, I like neon colors, but mm. I like neon colors generally. But getting good neon colors has been a bit of a pain. Yeah. Um, color, all of the colors. All like of the colors. As much color as possible. Super play. Uh, JJ and Marion asks, how many times a day do you thank God for Steph? Uh, uh, st- thank God that Steph is now part of your polycule. I mean, all all the time, every day. All they're, the time, every day. They're a wonderful, lovely yeah. part of the podcast. They are. That's very nice, very lovely. Um, ma- makes makes me very happy, and mm-hmm. makes I'm very happy to have them be in my life in that yeah. way. They're yeah. lovely. Yeah. They yeah. deserve good head pets. They do deserve good head pets, and have received good head pets. Indeed. I'm sure. Um, Ollie Hood asks, "When did you first realise you were Polly?" Um. When I met some other people who were poly and was sort of into the idea of, of, of dating them and went, let's stop and just have a think about my feelings about relationships. Like, I, it was more a case of like, okay, this is an option on the table. How do I feel about that? I've never really thought about it. And going, yeah, on a logical sense, I really don't see why not. And going, I'll give it a go. And it worked out pretty well. What about you? Um, I think I was in high school. Um, I I had this dream one night that I was dating my best friend, mm. and um, at one point I found them sleeping with somebody else, and I was like, "That's fine, you know, if if that's what you need to do, I I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not possessive about you. Yeah, obviously, love you very much, but that's another thing, and and I." mentioned this to friend and they were like yeah if you ever did that i would fucking punch you in the face because that no one mono 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 and i was like okay it was never gonna happen irl anyway it was just a dream i had but also like why why well, I don't understand yeah, the possessiveness. It, it wasn't until like the prospect, like seeing a poly couple or poly polycule in my vicinity and going, huh? I mean, yeah, I don't see why I couldn't. I and to get me to ask those questions about my own feelings mm. about monogamy versus non-monogamy. Yeah, love doesn't diminish when you yeah. share it with people. Indeed. In fact, if anything, there's less obligation for you to be everything for that person, oh, and yes. more people to support you in various ways that are specific to what you need. Indeed. Yeah. That is all of the questions. Well then, time for this. Do you know what I want to see more of? What do you want to see more of? Brochure Justice Warriors. Brochure Justice Warriors? Yeah. All right, Larry. All right, Barry. How are you doing? Yeah, you know, uh, oh, a bit overwhelmed, but... Uh, yeah, same, same. Hold it up. Hold it up as you do. Yeah, I need to really take my meds after this, actually. Oh, yeah, it's a reasonable idea. I'm getting yeah. better at taking mine. They've got, re- they got a set time of day now, which Yeah, we're a bit more focused, in it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've been frustrated about a thing, though. Yeah, yeah. I saw well, a thing on the news. What's been bothering it, it, you? It, it, it bugged me up. It annoyed me. Yeah. Real annoyed me. Yeah. 
So a report came out about the uh, Metropolitan Police here in the UK. The uh, another one. The Met. Yeah. What yeah. they done now? So this one. <sighs> More than half of Met Police who committed sexual misconduct offences still have their jobs as police. Now, when you say uh, misconduct offences, are you just talking about the uh, like the activists that they uh, infiltrated while undercover and, you know, in some cases had children with only specifically while they were undercover? It was, it was part of that. I mean, that's part of it. That that's, is certainly, that's definitely sexual. That is certainly that's sexual right. misconduct at the yeah. very least. Uh, even though we are talking about, you know, that we're also talking about police who, uh, you know, are on the record of having uh, abused their position of power to have access to women who were in vulnerable positions who <sighs> didn't feel they had the ability to walk away because they're police. Yeah. Um... Just a simple thought. Shut. First of all, cops fucking dismantle them, get rid of them in the first yep. place. But if you've got them, surely doing a crime like that should disqualify you from any position where you have that much power over the public. Absolutely. Like there is no world in which you should be able to do a crime that involves power dynamics and then keep that power position that allows you to still have that power dynamic. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for, you know, accepting that uh, people can grow and change as they get older, but I think if you are trying to hold that position of power and then that you've done something uh, something in that vein, that absolutely, you, you, you've you lost that. That's it, your I chance mean, is gone. Li literally, any kind of crime that, you know, has abused your position and uh, demonstrated that you cannot be trusted with that yeah. power should instantly disqualify you. They cannot you. be trusted. Stop fucking trusting them. Uh, 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 that's your hug. Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Good luck, mate. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Right, I think I'll uh, take me a minute and uh, put the kettle on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it sounds like a plan. Nice. <laughs> So, Laura. Me? Where can we find you upon the internet? Laura K. Buzz pretty much everywhere. Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Patreon, that's the one that pays the bills. Uh, TikTok, I post videos there whenever I remember. Um, I've got books, uh, uncomfortable labels, things I learned from Mario's butt, gender euphoria, they're all out now, and imminently other things. Imminently. Maybe keep an eye on our social media, like, very soon after this goes up, maybe. Definitely. Um, <coughs> uh, also, uh, podcast Pixel Square. It's about video game porn. Uh, Podquisition. Are your favourite video games great or perfect? We'll let you know. Um, Dice Funk. It's a Dungeons and Dragons podcast. I'm on seasons 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I'm on another podcast with you that isn't this one. With me, that'll be yeah. Polly Armoury. It's a D&D 5th edition real play podcast with questionable morals. Apologise for the delays in uploading at the moment. Uh, we have had a bit of a change in editors, and I just don't have a lot of time right now. I am doing my best. I will try and get one up, uh, if not this week, certainly next week, because y'all deserve the, the the good things. And we're getting quite near the end of it, so people we obviously are. want to know how that ends. Um, but yes, I will try and try and get that moving again as soon as possible. Things will probably slow down a bit in other ways soonish, yeah. and then I'll probably try and knock the whole lot out again. Either that, or I'll just have to take another holiday where I finish that. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, one day I'll get to make music again. Um, I make music under the name Bedroom Programmer. You can find that on my very specific Bedroom Programmer uh, SoundCloud. It's the one that looks like all computery rather than whatever that other Bedroom Programmer that suddenly sprung up is the, that's a thing um, I've got a Patreon that's one that pays my bills for as little as a dollar a month you can help me justify a uh, at too least, many hour work at week at least 76 there's probably more by now uh, work week 76 hour work week um, yeah uh, for ten dollars a month you can get early access to Queer and Pleasant Strangers and Polly Armory whenever fuck I get round to editing that um, and anything else that I happen to put up there, I try to do little exclusives for people. 
Um, um, all of my links can be found at streamerlinks.com slash janiac. That's J-A-N-E-I-A-C. Laura? Me? Will you sing us out, please, darling? Until next time, be a stranger. Mm-hmm.